so I do a lot of I do a lot of work with bands um a lot of them play really loud like heavy metal kind of stuff so it's mostly like dudes screaming in dark rooms um but it also it's something where it's kind of lined up really nicely with a lot of the stuff that I like to do for my personal work um so it's been really sort of convenient in that respect so I'll work with them on t-shirt designs and album covers and sometimes things like posters for shows um but then I have my own whole body of personal work um that it's kind of like a big exploration of things that interest me um I have relatively wide-ranging interests I love to read I love you know um I love comic books comic books were one of sort of the first things that got me like really excited about drawing um I love art history I love the history of medicine um I don't know I'm sort of a bit of a magpie um in that respect so um I, lots of different things will catch my eye. Um, magpies are often known for being sort of this like bird that comes and like sees something shiny and then like collects it and like keeps it. Um, so you'll often see magpie nests are full of like jewelry or coins or whatever. And I feel like I'm a little bit of a visual magpie. Um, so most of what I do in my personal work, it's sort of like medical images or illustration, a lot of stuff that has to do with sort of disease and sort of what gets called like body horror. Um, but also a lot of it really sort of deals with more like emotional states. So feeling anxious, feeling overwhelmed, feeling sad and trying to sort of evoke that feeling in the work that I make. Um, I also, a lot of my work is very sort of uh, focused on, I guess what you would call like the female gaze. Um, so historically a lot of art throughout Western art history, especially has been sort of focused on like the female body as viewed by sort of a more male controlled society. So, um, a lot of the stuff that I do is a little bit more kind of trying to reclaim ownership of that form. Um, and then just sort of lastly, I, I, with the whole magpie thing, I really like sort of finding beauty in these really unexpected places. Um, so, you know, my, my phone is constantly running out of space because I'm taking photos of everything everywhere. Um, and so I just kind of try and keep a catalog of that because it's a nice sort of visual journey or journal of things that have interested me over time. So if I notice that I'm taking a lot of photos of something, you know, then I might start thinking about like, how does that, that get incorporated into my work? So with that said, um, I have sort of two major categories of work. I know that this is more of like an illustration focused class. Um, I think illustration as a term sort of has a lot of weird baggage. Um, so a lot of weird associations with it. I don't really think of myself as an illustrator, but I do illustration work. Um, and the reason I don't really think of myself as an illustrator is because I'm not very good at executing someone else's creative vision or sort of just, you know, taking a prompt that somebody has and kind of running with that. Um, for me to do work and to sort of do, I think, what I consider a good job on it, I have to be really excited about what it is. Um, so one of the things that that means is actually I, I don't do this for a living. Um, I pay my rent with a completely unrelated job. Um, but one of the things that's kind of nice about that is that then that gives me the freedom to say yes and no um, to different commissions. It also means that I don't have to modify my work based on what I think will sell um, because it's not how I pay my rent. It's not how I feed myself. Um, so I get to sort of make some choices with my work that are a little bit freer. Um, the downside of that is that I don't have as much time for making art as I would like. There are always trade-offs. Um, but yeah, so I have two major categories of work. One is sort of the work that I do for myself. Um, and then I do a lot of work for these bands. And it's usually one of three things. Usually it's album covers or t-shirt designs. Um, sometimes it's posters. Usually people need posters a lot faster. Um, so usually not posters as much for me, or if I do a poster, it'll be like a digital collage. Um, 
album covers usually take me a lot longer because they're usually a little bit more involved um, and t-shirts have sort of a more uh, specific set of technical needs because they need to be printed on a t-shirt. So I can't get quite as um, fussy and fiddly with that. But in order to sort of like kind of do the work that I like to do, um, you know, the, the work that I like the most kind of ends up being a little bit of both personal work and commission work. So um, I really love when a band comes to me and says, you know, we've seen your work, we would love for you to do something in your style for us. Um, and then sort of gives me the freedom to respond to that. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about the actual process for that and like what that's like for me. But, you know, I, I turn down a lot of commissions because I don't think that they would be right, but also because I don't have a lot of time outside of work. So I have to be a little bit more uh, protective, I think, of some of the, the things that I say yes to and some of that time. So I'm going to start with some examples of um, album artwork that I've done, because I think that that's kind of I think that's kind of a fun thing. Um, doing album artwork, I think, is really um, gratifying, but it's also really scary in a way, because that's the thing that somebody sees before they listen to um, somebody else's music. And when somebody comes to me and asks if they want or if I can do an album cover for them, um, I know that there's a lot of trust being placed in me for that, because this is, you know, somebody who has made a whole album of songs, a lot of their own creative like heart and soul has gone into that. So it's it's their creative output. And when they come to me to ask to do the artwork for the album, I think that's a huge amount of trust um, that they're placing in me because they're saying, hey, like we put our heart and soul into this thing and we think that you would be the best person to represent that. So one of my favorite recent ones that I've done is for this band called Pyrife. Um, and for reference, this is not a huge piece. Um, you'll see in a little bit, I have a, a process video, um, but it was something that I did in 2021. Um, the album came out in 2022 because there's um, a really large backlog for vinyl production in the United States. Um, so people actually still put things on vinyl records because um, uh, especially in metal, which, you know, it, uh, it's sort of an underground music scene. Uh, a lot of people who are fans of this tend to actually like sort of the physical object. So um, with this, uh, I used a series of a couple of different tools. Um, I, Josh mentioned that you guys are working with sort of nib pens and ink. Um, that's kind of my favorite way to work. Uh, so I'll often kind of use that as like the, the uh, foundation for the drawing that I'm doing. Um, because I had to do this one a little bit faster, uh, I used uh, Prismacolor markers because I think the coloring process is a lot faster for that for me um, because I have a set range of colors. Um, for me, I like if I'm mixing paints, I'm a little bit more indecisive. So it's, that part of it takes a lot longer. Um, but with a Prismacolor marker set, I have to like pick specific colors. Um, and then uh, I actually also ended up using some felt tip pens because one thing that I will just sort of note is that uh, there are a lot of things that I've had to sort of figure out on my own about materials. Um, cause the stuff that I use, uh, I'll just kind of use it cause I've picked it up somewhere. I won't necessarily look up the best way to use it. Um, and that means that I sort of learned some things on the fly. So I started this piece by drawing it in ink with a, a nib pen, and then I colored on top of that with the Prismacolor markers. But then there's something about those markers that actually changes the texture of the paper. Um, so I had to go back in with a felt tip pen because if I use a like dip nib, it actually bleeds on paper that's been like drawn on with a, one of the alcohol markers. So something that I didn't know for a really long time, something that was really frustrating also when I didn't know it. And I finally think I figured it out that you can kind of go back in with a felt tip pen because it's, it's sort of like the same general um, 
kind of process, I think, or I don't, I don't really know what the chemical <laughs> explanation is kind of wish I did, but, um, so the other thing that happens is when I'm drawing, I actually use, um, I use speedball, super black ink mostly. Cause I like how, um, thick it is and how quick drying it is. Cause I'm less likely to smudge. Um, but that means it also dries on my pen pretty fast. So I actually just use like most of my t-shirts don't have sleeves at this point. And I just use the sleeves that I've cut off to uh, clean the nibs of my pen. <laughs> um, but so I'm gonna show you a couple of details. With this one, um, this is a commission where a friend of mine basically said like, hey, this album's coming out. I'd really love for you to do this. I have an image in mind already. And normally when somebody comes to me with an image in mind, I'm usually like, eh, I don't really, not super excited about that. But in this case, he specifically mentioned sort of a bunch of fungus and lichen and things like that. And that's actually something where I've been collecting images of those um, for a really long time. Like if I go on a walk in the woods and I see a tree covered in lichen or a rock, I will take a photo of it. I have folders and folders of photos that I've taken of this kind of stuff. Um, and so it was sort of like a really nice opportunity in that respect because I was like I've been looking for an excuse to draw this stuff so in that case it was one of those things where um I just kind of said yes because I was it was really exciting um I didn't really have the time to do it but I said yes anyway um and then within it to um you know I I got to kind of play with some colors that I don't necessarily always work with so um, I do have also just a selection of some of the images that I found, because one of the things that happens is when I take on a project um, for myself or for somebody else, I tend to be sort of a compulsive researcher. So I really, really like taking the time to collect a whole bunch of things, learn about stuff um, that I'm gonna draw. Because I think the more I know about something, the more insightful some of my choices can be. Um, and I think I'm also just kind of a big nerd. So, you know, learning about different fungus and different lichen is really fun. Um, I had a different project at one point where a friend of mine asked me about, or to do a, a, a t-shirt where the title was Sky Burial for the album that the t-shirt was for. And so I spent, you know, uh, like a month researching sky burials and different traditions around the world before I like landed on the image that I wanted to do. And then also based on that, I found a whole bunch of things about different vultures that are participants in sky burials. So, you know, it, I basically, I like to sort of follow those rabbit holes. Um, what are sky burials? So sky burials, um, and I'll show you the t-shirt itself. I think just going back, um, it was the, I'm just going to go back a couple. It was a, um, so it's this sort of rainbow thing here. Um, a sky burial um, is something basically where uh, after somebody dies, their body is kind of like left out to be consumed usually by different birds of prey. So it's usually vultures. Um, the most famous ones are in sort of the Himalayas, but there are sky burials in different parts of the world as well. Like the Native American, some certain Native American cultures would have sky burials where they would build a liter, like they would build a, a structure and put a dead body on top of it. And then the birds would come and eat it. And so the idea is that, you know, after somebody dies, their body then is um, sort of returned to nature because it feeds a whole bunch of these different carrion birds. So in this case, like I got to research the different types of birds and the different types of traditions. And I learned about a bird that literally can digest bones, like that kind of stuff. So, wow. yeah. So it's, it's partly an excuse to just kind of learn cool new things. Um, in this case, I got to stare at a bunch of pictures of different lichens. Like I'd seen some lichens like the stuff on the bottom right before but like this weird rust colored orange with the black around it I'd never seen anything like that before um sorry sorry to interrupt. is, is it please 
it is it like can you can you wrangle it where you can have that done legally in America? Can you say this is my religious belief and it's actually, the, I don't sorry. know. Yeah, I'm going to mm-hmm. research that. That's really fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I the, there's a Zoroastrian tradition of sky burials that was very specific and very interesting, but I felt like I wasn't really qualified <laughs> to to kind of pick that one apart. Um, but it was really fascinating. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like with something like the lichens too, it, one of the things that was really fun about this is, so most of these are photos that I took from the internet just by researching different things. And so, you know, I would say like, I would look for turkey tail mushrooms, which are these ones on the top right. Um, and then I would find all of these different colors of turkey tail mushrooms that existed. Um, but the one on the top left is a photo that I took probably like 10 years ago, um, just on a walk in the woods. Um, and it's the type of thing where taking a lot of these photos and finding a lot of them online also changes the way that I walk through the world a little bit because it, I learned to look for other things. Um, so it's sort of fun in that respect. Um, I do have, so One thing that is kind of um, nice, but also annoying, is that in order to be an artist on social media now, um, everybody wants you to also make videos. Um, So I have a short video of just like the process. I don't know if it's going to play music. Actually, I can I can make it not play music. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, So this is just a a quick video of like some of the process of making that piece. Um, So a lot of the stuff that I'll do, I'll start with like a pencil drawing. Um, I use uh, non-photo blue and non-photo red pencils, not for any particular reason other than I really like the texture. (laughs) Um, I think one thing that a lot of people will tell you is that, um, you know, the the material that you use doesn't matter so much as your enjoyment of how you use it. Um, like the the micron pens and felt tip pens, I actually don't usually use them because I don't like how they feel um, when I'm drawing. So there's something about um, the the blue and red pencils. Um, they're like very traditional cartoonists and comic book and animator tools. Um, and I think because I was really interested in comics, um, I just saw them mentioned, um, but there's something very different for me about using those versus using like an HB pencil or like a 4H pencil or something for my underdrawing. Um, I just like the blue or the red a lot more. I've been using the red recently. The blue is sort of my original one that I was using, but I've been using the red recently for um, a lot of figure work because it doesn't erase very well, Yeah, but it will also leave this sort of like really nice sort of red ghost behind. That's kind of fun. The blue, I think erases a little bit better. When I was working on a project and Al Milgram for Marvel Comics, you know, he's like a decades long uh, anchor at Marvel. So he inked over some of my stuff. And when I sent it in, I'd use blue and red pencil. And he said, you know, you, the red is a no go. He's like, it used to disappear during the photographic process, but the technology we use now, it doesn't. And I was like, oh man, he goes, it's okay. I can work with it. He goes, I'll just, um," and I think he just put in some lines where he went, uh, he just doubled and tripled up some of my sketchy lines and he disguised it over the red lines. And then yeah. he erased, he whited out the other ones. So when I'm working, makes- I think about that sometimes. If I have a gray, if I have a pencil line I can't get rid of, sometimes I'll ink right over it, even though I didn't originally plan plan it to be there. I'll turn it into cross hatching. Yeah, well, and that's actually one of the things about working with ink. Like right now I have a piece that I'm working on where I straight up just dropped ink on my piece. It's there now, it's ink, it's part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's one of the things I also actually really like about working in ink is because, um, you kind of can't take it back. Um, I mean, like you can, but I sort of like being forced to commit. I'm actually quite bad at working digitally because I think there's too much choice. So I don't really do it. 
Mm. Everything I do for the most part is um, analog. So like this is gouache. Mostly there's some spots of pen and ink. Um, and it's because, yeah, sorry, say that again. I, I'm sorry, I just, just it's amazing. Yeah, well, I just like, I don't like it. And that's the thing is like, people like what they like. I have nothing against digital work. There's amazing digital work out there. I just really like the um, the tactile sensation of like working on primarily paper, but um, I have an example of some scratch board later that I think is also kind of fun because that's another one where it's like kind of very, um, you like you're literally like scratching into things um but like with with pen and ink one of the other reasons i like the pen nib that's metal is because i like how it feels with a micron pen or like a felt tip pen that's like a very fine line i'm always really afraid i'm going to bend the nib um and i often do <laughs> so i don't like working with them but i like working with the um the the pen nibs where you dip them because i just the the way that it feels is really nice so um, this is another one where it's an album cover. Um, it's for a sort of a younger band. Um, and I, they, they kind of messaged me. Um, most people that I work with are either people that I know or somebody who messages me on Instagram. Um, and they messaged me and they said, hey, we really like your work. We would love for you to do something in your style. This is what we have in mind. And I was like, cool, this sounds like personal work for me. So absolutely um and they were really open to kind of like whatever I wanted um and they were really sweet um so I said yes so um I started with a toned paper and then I used gouache which um I don't know if you guys know what gouache is but um it's like a it's an opaque uh watercolor or it's like an opaque water-based paint it's very like a watercolor um it used to be used in a lot of like advertising or um, editorial work because um, when you photographed it, it would sort of look flat and it would sort of like the way that you photographed it, it would reproduce really well and really faithfully. Um, so it was this sort of weirdly commercial medium. Um, but at some point, literally with gouache, like I don't know why I started using it other than somebody suggested that I use it. So I bought a lot of it and then I had it. So I just decided to learn to use it. Um, it's a very kind of fussy um, medium. Uh, I've had to do a lot of learning with it um, and kind of struggled with it. So, but it, it's been a good learning experience. So um, this is mostly gouache. Um, with some periods of like cross hatching pen and ink um, and just some detail moments here. I know they get a little pixelated, but you can kind of see, I get a little bit involved in like backgrounds and stuff like that. Cause I just, um, I really like um, just sort of unnecessary ornamental stuff um just stuff that exists for the sake of being pretty and that's it it's not really there for any other reason um and especially I think with some of the other work that I do because I do have this sort of um a lot of stuff that's kind of gross honestly um I really like to have sort of that counterpoint of like and here's a lot of stuff that's here for no other reason than I think it's pretty um so with this one I have a collection of the reference images here um, all of the photographs are ones that I took. Um, the flowers are morning glories that grow on a fence, um, kind of on my way to my studio, and I thought they were really beautiful. Um, but also morning glories as a flower, they're a, sort of like a choking vine. Um, and I thought that was sort of interesting because there's the, these beautiful pink flowers, some purple, like they, they're these gorgeous, colorful things. Um, but they kind of kill anything that they grow on top of, um, because they kind of choke it out, which is a little sinister. Um, and so I thought there's something kind of nice to that. Um, I also, I think the first time that I learned what they were, I was a little kid and I said, oh, wow, those are really pretty. And wh whoever the adult was that I was talking to, um, was like, yeah, they're pretty, but did you know that they kill stuff? And I was like, yeah, okay, now, now I like them even more. Um, 
So, you know, I had a lot of people <laughs> encouraging me in the wrong way um, or the right way. But the the lichen, it's on a brick wall near my mom's old house. Um, the the big sort of ornamental stuff up here, um, it's from this PDF that I found of uh, an old book of how to draw acanthus ornamentation. So acanthus is this like old kind of, um, it's based on an actual plant called acanthus, but it, it's like this style of ornamentation um, in old books. I think a lot of the time as like sort of like ornamental flourishes in the margins or sort of like around like in a frame actually. So you can definitely find examples of like frames and like borders that are made out of these like really ornate acanthus designs. Um, and then just down here is like the kind of super rudimentary sketch um, that I used to sort of talk to the folks. And this is the awkward photo of myself that I took to base the whole drawing on. Um, I do take a lot of reference photos, um, usually of myself because I'm there and it's convenient and I'm kind of shy. So I don't like asking other people because it's like a whole like logistical kind of complicated thing. Um, but also a lot of my work is really gross and it feels really weird to be like, hey person, can I take your photo and then do a bunch of weird stuff to your face? Um, it's a lot easier to do that to myself. But so I do have um, sort of a slightly more in-depth process photo for this one, but you can see like this one I started with red pencil um, and the the paper is this sort of like toned paper. And I started doing this kind of toned paper with this like a sort of washi um, because I like that it's like a, an irregular surface. So it gives me something to kind of respond to. In this case, I've covered most of it up, but for some other pieces, I've kind of let a lot more of it shine through as kind of like the overall texture. Um, but yeah, so in this particular case, oh, also sort of the background to, in addition to the acanthus, I also, when I get stuck on something, I will flip through art books that I have because I like to see how other people solve problems. Um, and so in this case, I found um, some Alphonse Mucha branches that I really liked. And so I sort of borrowed that a little bit um, and put some of that up around the edges at the top. But yeah, I mean, if I get stuck um, on something, I will often look at other people's art because I, one, I get really excited about other people's art in general. Um, but two, it's really fun to see how people think about using space or color or line, um, cause they're using it in a way that I don't. Um, and usually also in that case, um, it, it works out okay for me because I am not very good at drawing or painting in a way that is kind of anything other than how I paint. Um, my technical abilities are fine, but they're not such that like, I can just copy how somebody else did something. I'm always gonna copy it in the way that like, I know how to. So it's always gonna look a little bit different. Um, but yeah, so that was this particular piece. Uh, so this is another one. This one's a little bit different because it's obviously a lot brighter. <laughs> um, I really like, very bright colors. Um, this one is another album cover. This one's for an instrumental metal band that has a bassoon in it. Um, they're very weird, very jazzy. Um, but again, this is a, a band where they came to me and said, hey, we would love, um, you know, sort of a psychedelic painting or drawing of a person's face melting. And I was like, okay, cool. I can do that. That's in my general, um, area of interests. So this, however, I worked on before I knew that using pen nibs on Prismacolor markers was not gonna be fun. Um, so it was not the most fun process, but uh, I did for this one, um, this was my idea of a simple background. 
which I think is, I have a, a habit of deciding that I'm going to do something and thinking that it's simple, and then this is what happens. So um, I was working on this one, and um, my partner walked through the room, and he was like, I thought that you were going to do a simple background. It's like, this is simple. Um, this one also has some of that kind of lichen-like texture in here, also a little bit of um, slime molds because I thought those were also really cool. Uh, a friend of mine at one point had me watch a documentary about slime molds and they're very cool if you haven't learned about them. Sorry, I'm opening a seltzer can. Um, they are a group of organisms that can kind of like make decisions and think. They can solve puzzles. They can go through mazes. Um, they're a really interesting collective group of organisms that sort of work towards a single purpose. Um, but yeah, so slime molds were, were sort of on the brain. And then, yeah, so this one, you can kind of see a little bit more of just like the, um, kind of colors and stuff for the face, but the background was kind of based on, um, there are these really beautiful, uh, Islamic temples that have these really ornate ceilings that have these big patterns that kind of go in different directions. And there's something to me about um, creating sort of these repeating patterns that I find really calming and relaxing. So I sort of like to put them into pieces, one, because I like looking at them, but also because the process of actually drawing them, I find very enjoyable. Um, and I think a lot of the times when, when you're working on visual art, a lot of people sort of talk about like what should go in there from a conceptual standpoint, but I think it's really important to leave room for the, just the things that you like, because on a subconscious level, sometimes you will make choices um, that end up really working that you might not be able to explain at the time, but then sort of, you know, you can kind of back your way into later, or you might decide like, oh yeah, okay, that's what I was doing there. But I think it's important to kind of leave room to, to sort of play and experiment. So with that one, that was definitely a little bit of what I was doing. Um, so these are some other album covers that I've done. Um, I picked these three and then realized that I'd picked three that all had hands as the central motif. Um, so just sort of an entertaining accidental pick. Um, mm. These are all metal bands of some description. Um, the one on the left is very strange. Um, the center one is a little bit more of a kind of like a punk feel. Um, and the one on the right is the most recent of the three drawings uh, and paintings. Um, and that one is for more of like a kind of mainstream metal band. So then I do also a lot of t-shirts. Um, this is probably the only point at which I really do much digital work because I have to do the colors digitally and make sure that people can print them. Um, but these are just some recent ones that I've done. This is the Sky Burial one again. Um, this one is one that was for a project um, sort of about grief um, and that they kind of gave me like total freedom on that one as well. Um, this one with the lady with the octopus on her head is really the, so of these five drawings, two of them are ones where I had a clear instruction and they were things that I said yes to. So the one with the lady with the octopus on her head, that was an idea that one of the band members had. Um, and then the old guy, the red one on the bottom right, um, that was for some friends who their idea was that they had an album cover that their other friend had done but his, uh, his drawing style doesn't really print very well. Um, so they wanted to see if I could do sort of my take on his work. And so they said like, hey, you, you know, here's what the album cover looks like, um, but we wanna see what you would do with this image. So I kept the basic face pretty similar, like as far as the features, but I added a lot of um, sort of texture and scarring that wasn't quite there in the first place. And then I added some flies as well. 
Um, that one though is interesting because that was actually done on a scratch board. So I'll get more into that in a little bit, but scratch board is a very specific way of working. So, but so those are most of the um, band commissions that I've done sort of recently, but I did kind of want to walk you guys through what the band short commission process looks like for me. Um, Cause I think it's kind of, it's interesting because it's like a, uh, it, you, you are collaborating with somebody, um, but you're also kind of doing it your own way. So the band will contact me. And then I'll usually ask them a series of questions. Um, Cause I want to know like, if this is going to be a good fit for me or for them, they'll answer those questions. And then if I actually like, if I like the answers, I'll start actually thinking about what to draw. If I don't, I'll usually kind of send them to somebody else. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll start doing that research. So like with the sky burial thing, I spent like a month and a half reading about sky burials and finding different images and sort of collecting the things that I was interested in. Um, then I'll send back uh, a rough concept sketch. My concept sketches are not very like fleshed out. I know you guys are probably doing thumbnails and stuff like that. Um, I usually get people to trust me a lot on that one. Um, it's usually what we would colloquially call chicken scratch because it looks like a chicken has scratched it because it's not very good. Um, and then they, if they trust me and they say, okay, then I get a bunch of reference photos, then I'll do a pencil drawing. I probably don't map out all of the details in my pencil drawing because I don't like planning that far ahead. Um, but also I like to sort of leave myself a little bit of room and then I'll start inking when I'm happy with the basic drawing. And then I usually get stuck for a little bit and have to figure out what to do with the areas that I didn't actually plan. Um, and usually at that point, I sort of curse and yell at myself for not planning particularly well. And then I have to look for more reference photos, but then I'll sort of finish and scan the drawing. And then I'll use Photoshop usually to make a file for the printer. I'll have to color it sometimes. And then I send it to the band and then they make a shirt and then hurry, there's a shirt. Um, and if I run into somebody in public who is wearing the shirt, I am a really big dork about it and get really excited. So that's kind of a lot, all of my like more commercially stuff. So I wanted to sort of quickly run through some recent personal work of mine. Um, so it's a little bit different, but it's not that different. Um, but one of the things that I've been doing recently is sort of building this like little world that's kind of made out of all of these kind of weird, fleshy, um, different like body parts and stuff like that. Uh, and then I'll put sort of these figures into them. Um, in this one, I also got to invent some little critters, um, little animals to go in there as well. Um, Cause I, I really like when you get uh, those medieval drawings, medieval Western drawings where you have very strange beasts that, you know, maybe don't make sense in real life, but they're little demons and stuff like that. So this is another sort of um, thing where I started with toned paper and I've started to kind of build in like the, the backgrounds and the ink. And then I might put in some like light color washes, but I've had a lot of fun kind of pulling in highlights with white ink. So it's like starting with a middle value and kind of pushing in highlights and pushing in dark spaces. But I've, I've started to really like working that way. Um, I've also included this picture up at the top right, so you can get a sense of the scale of a lot of these. My drawings aren't that big, um, so this is the size of my hand, and I have kind of long fingers. So the drawing itself was maybe 13 inches across and 9 inches high, so it really kind of packs a lot of detail in there. It's part of why I use the mapping nibs is because they're really fine. Can you talk uh, about can you talk at all about the color theory behind your stuff? I'm seeing a lot of, yeah. uh, it's all pink and little touches of purple and little touches of yellow. Um, and there's a good balance between cool purples and kind of warmer colors. Is that something that you are focused on balancing when you're doing this work? Yeah, so with this, I, I don't find myself to be very comfortable with color. So I tried to give myself a sort of limited number of colors to work with. Um, but I do really like color. So it was kind of trying to balance like, okay, I like color, but I'm not co super comfortable with it. So like, how do I kind of bring those two together? 
Um, and so with this, I started by toning the paper with, it was either a crimson or like a perylene maroon or something like that, where it was just a pigment that I liked. And so I was like, okay, this is a color that I like. Um, and then I started having to layer stuff on top of that. So one of the things about this is that with the purples and the yellows, the color that's underneath is kind of always going to come through a little bit. Um, so when I put the yellow down on top of it, I have to know that like, it's really going to be more of like an orange because it is transparent and there's like a pinky thing underneath it with the purples. I'll look at the reference photographs that I've taken and I'll say like, this is a little bit more of like a, like a shadowy place in the drawing in the figure. And like, I want to sort of push that back with a little bit of cool colors, but I also know that with some of the purples and the pinks, like some of the shadows are a little bit warmer. Some of the shadows are a little bit darker. So I might lean pink for the warmer stuff, purple for the darker stuff. I also just really like playing compliments off of each other. So that's why there's some purple and some yellow. Mm -hmm. um, some of it was also just like what colors of ink that I had lying around. Um, I do sometimes like limiting myself based on just what the material is that I have there and saying, okay, what, what can I do with this? Um, cause I think that you can get some really fun stuff when you're sort of limiting yourself to, to a few things. I did put in some like pops of blue and turquoise kind of after the fact, cause I thought it was kind of missing a little bit of that cool, like pure cool. Cause I think the purples, while they're cooler, they still live very much within that kind of pinky world. So I wanted to put some accent pops that were like a lot different. Um, the the sort of the stuff in the background as well, actually, like I tried to push things back by kind of creating like a false sense of atmospheric perspective. Um, and in this world, for whatever reason, that's pink. Hmm. Um, but it's one of those things where, you know, I, I think in that sense, when you sort of can commit to something, you can kind of create a, a set of rules that your brain will make sense out of later. So if I decide that, you know, pink is the color of the atmosphere in this world, and I commit to that, then it's a consistent set of rules. And whoever's looking at it, their brain sort of makes sense out of that. Because our brains kind of do a lot of work to make sense of visual information that's in front of us. Um, I mean, like you guys have seen this with like perspective, like if you're looking at a painting and you see perspective in it, it's a flat surface. There's no depth to it, but there is enough information in it that your brain thinks, ah, yes, there's depth here and can tell you like this thing is behind this thing or this thing is in front of this thing. Um, so in this case, I think using sort of a consistent set of rules, I think actually also the pinks that I was using were a little on the cooler side. So they're like for the background, so they're like a little bit more purpley pink than right. sort of like orangey pink in the front. Um, so it was like a little atmospheric perspective there. One of my teachers in school said that um, the ultraviolet spectrum, it kind of dominates as you go back further in space. So that he would recommend I would make things that were far distance that I go over them with purple tones. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've taken, um, I took a landscape painting course at one point too. And the way that atmospheric perspective was described there is that, um, atmosphere literally has water in it uh -huh. and the sky is blue because it's sort of refracting specific pieces of like specific types of light. But so atmosphere itself kind of creates these like sort of more muted bluer things. So the farther away something gets the bluer or more purple, Mm -hmm. it might get but it also usually gets a little bit less there's a little, like less contrast it's a little less crisp because there is sort of um atmosphere that you can't really see but you can see it w when there's that much distance if that makes sense so like mm -hmm. there's not that much atmosphere between like me and something here but between me and something really far away there's a lot of atmosphere so it makes things a little bit softer where did you study um, I went to the University of Pennsylvania in uh, Philadelphia, mm -hmm. which is not an art school, um, but had an art major. So I took a lot of other classes as well. Um, I did a summer course at one point in Italy that was uh, landscape painting. So, mm -hmm. 
yeah, a uh, really interesting set of teachers. One of them was kind of a jerk. He knew a lot about landscape painting, not a lot about being a nice person. Um, so, you know, you always encounter like at least one of those guys. What do you think that was about? Was it about like him not wanting to be there or about him kind of enjoying sort of a power trip and being power uh, tripping? Yeah. I, I I encountered somebody at some point later, actually, who had had him um, at the school where he normally taught. And apparently the summer program kids got the nice version of him. Uh -huh. So I, I sh I'm very afraid of what he was like during the school year. Right. <laughs> Heard a lot of stories of him like flipping painting tables over and stuff like that. So yeah. I mean, nice guy. What's your experience with a, good, with a good to bad ratio of teachers? I would say half of my teachers were chaos. And then like a small, small segment of them were what teachers are supposed to be. Um, it's a good question. I don't know. Um, with, cause I definitely had good teachers, but they were sort of like, I had teachers that were really nice also, and they were so nice that they weren't all that helpful. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Um, but sometimes I would have a mean teacher who then also would tell me things that I needed to hear, but that like the nice teachers wouldn't tell you. So it was, but it was challenging because you sort of have to learn who you're going to listen to. Um, and no one tells you how to make sense of that. Uh, and I still don't think I did a very good job of it in my undergraduate work. Like I actually stopped working on art for the most part after I graduated and had to like really get myself back into it because I was just so tired of getting, um, you know, conflicting feedback from like 19 different people. That's really funny. When, when, um, you know, the artist Jeffrey Brown. Yeah. The, yeah. The, yeah. Uh, the cartoonist. Yeah. He went to yeah. comics because he felt like art had been kind of contaminated for him by um by by the same process having all these different people interfering with his growth and it was it, it was almost like a way of trying to get his own space he said yeah. comics because nobody had taught him how to do it and he said that the freedom to do wrong like he said he since evolved in a different direction but at the time all of his hands always looked like little what he called little grabby hands like a kid's hands and he would uh said I'm always he goes that's he goes I know how to draw a right hand but it's incredibly like liberating for him to do the little right. grabby hands yeah I would actually say like broadly um one of the things that I thought was helpful was people who would drive home the point that learning how to do stuff meant that you then had the ch choice later of doing stuff that way or not mm -hmm. um it was like learning learning the technical skills um and getting like really good at rendering in a specific way just taught you a set of vocabulary um so then later on like to extend the analogy if you want to use uh specific types of types of words when you're writing a story it's not that you only know those types of words, it's that you're choosing those words because they do what you want them to do. Or like if you decide that you're gonna write poetry, you're using a style that you learned because you want to write in that style. I don't know. I think for me, um, school was a little bit different because it wasn't an art school, um, but also I didn't really fit into the illustration box but I didn't fit into the art box. So I was too illustration for all of the art people and I was too art for all of the illustration people. I kind of still am, I think. Um, I've just learned not to care. Um, and that part's really freeing. So um, I think I stopped caring about what I should be doing and just started doing what I liked doing. And like, there, there are a lot of very profane ways that I can describe the attitude that that takes. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's frustrating in some senses because, you know, I still don't, I, I exist very much in my own space, um, which means that I don't have great access to a lot of spaces because they don't necessarily know what to do with me. But I think that's part of why I've ended up working with so many sort of like heavy music bands 
because a lot of them are a little bit more out there and experimental and weird and they're sort of willing to kind of just you know check out something that's different and and sort of approach it on its own merits I don't know I mean I, I don't have a graduate degree either because I can't think of a place that would take me oh I could think of places <laughs> but yeah it's uh it's, but it'd be expensive company. so what well, um your stuff is also really time consuming like yesterday I had another artist um Dina Sooto was talking and she's a Russian born um artist who uh has a really intense career right now doing doing like she'll get you know doing double page spreads in the New Yorker and um New Republic and all these other intense magazines amazing, it, but I couldn't do that and there's something very yeah um there's something very heroic about both of your works and there's something about uh very rooted and kind of um very rooted in like a love of art traditions um and stuff that like illustration standards that were really prevalent in the mid 20th century where there was like a a love of classicism but she figured out how to work really fast now you have talked about needing a certain amount of time to do your stuff are any of these examples of things where you had a tighter deadline and you needed yes. to compromise and ma manage to get something that you were satisfied with that was also done like faster on a somebody else's time timetable yeah and actually the thing that i'm working on right now like i have like two weeks to finish it and that's not really enough because i have you know a job on top of that but the thing on the left here is something where it's deliberately quite small it's about seven inches by 10 inches um because I knew that I had a very short timeline and then I was like ah yes I'll just make it simple and this was my attempt at simple um and uh the background where it's black like solid black is because at that point I was like I don't know what to do here I cannot solve this problem it is a black void now but it ended up working in that sense and I liked what it did as far as like creating sort of this more menacing environment but it also made the figure stand out a lot better really does yeah so that part was kind of nice insofar as like it actually solved a problem for me because I was like well well shoot I need to get this done in like three days can I do it um yeah and actually there was a t-shirt that I I worked on um a couple weeks ago where I had just finished this piece and then I gave myself I think I had three days to draw the t-shirt um and I don't have the drawing of it here but it like it was a lot simpler because I had a tighter de like deadline mm -hmm. yeah um Dina said something about how she goes you know sometimes you're not finished with something but it doesn't you mean abandon it's it. not a good illustration. It's presentable. Yeah. It just doesn't meet the standard that you want. And it reminds yeah. me, it reminds me a lot of um, I gotta find this image, but you know Durf, right? No. Um, the cartoonist, he did my friend, my friend Dahmer. Oh, uh, I know of him. I don't really know his work super well. So he published, he used to do editorial work and he published this amazing image that he did in the early eighties where there was a miscommunication before cell phones, where he was, he was doing this beautiful image of two forces, two figures confronting each other. And one was building a wall and the other was simultaneously tearing down the wall, if I remember it right. And it was very like, it looked like it could have been a social realist image from the fifties or something. It was really crap. <laughs> classical like almost like a looked like a labor rights image and um he said they got a phone call that they're on their way to pick it up and he like was rushing to finish it up and as a result he had all these detailed bricks and then there's all these areas where the bricks are really graphic and empty and he wasn't satisfied he was like oh you know these guys they gave they they were really um they were, were, had me working across purposes. Uh, I thought I had a week and they were they were like, no, we're, somebody's coming over right now to get it. And then it was in print. It's such an interesting lesson about the way that time, um, time constraints working in editorial can change your work. Yeah. I mean, and actually like with this one, I had a deadline and like 
I had like two days before I needed to scan it. And then I was like, okay, fine. I'm just going to do this. And like, I realized that's ridiculous when I look at this right now. And I'm like, this is what I settled for. Mm -hmm. But like, it's the type of thing where I think for the most part for me, pretty much everything. So these two were also for um, art shows. So I like at a certain point had to be like, no, it's done. Um, I think a lot of people will tell you that like, you know, for, for work, it's never really like truly finished. You just abandon it. Mm -hmm. And you just decide like, I'm not working on this anymore. And you like abandon it. I can. So. That. Yeah. I think that's why people like digital is because you can change it a bunch and still have the other draft. You go back to it and you realize that the other one wasn't as bad as you thought, or that's why that's yeah. That's yeah. why I can't do digital is because that gives me too many options. Like, it's not that I can't do it. It's just that like my brain, the way that I've like learned to do stuff, I, I don't know how to do that because it, to me, that's paralyzing. Like that's too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With I this, if I draw something, I, I have to commit. Um, so like with these two, like I would have to um, sort of just like stick to it. So like the one on the right, actually these were both for like a, a show. So like I had a deadline because I had a show. Um, and so in that sense, like it was okay, well, it's done. Um, cause I have to mail it across country and make sure that it gets there in time. And I have to frame it before that. So like with both of these, there was some of that. Um, and actually with these as well. Yeah. So basically it's wow. funny cause with personal work, with personal work, I just like, I do it for shows because it gives me a deadline that I have to work towards. So it means that I get something done um, and that I'm not endlessly picking at it. I might start something at some point when I'm like between shows or whatever um, and just start something for the hell of it. But then like, it might take me literally years to finish it if I don't decide that it's gonna be for a show. Is the person on the right, um, is that somebody, it looks like a portrait, like is yeah. that- it's so both was, of them are. It's who? So both of them are portraits. Um, so the one on the left is my friend, Jesse. Mm -hmm. um, and it's based on a photo that I took of him while he was playing a show. Um, so both of these dudes are, are, are guys that I know because I know like through music. Um, and then the one on the right, it's a guy where I was like, you have a really interesting face. Do you mind if I draw your face? I know that sounds like total weirdo stuff, but like, mm -hmm. can I draw your face? Um, so I took a photo of him. It was a very, very neutral photo. Um, it's like not a photo where I was terribly excited about the photo, but I thought he had an interesting face. So it was kind of more about his face than anything else. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, also like working with other people's faces is really sort of challenging for me. Um, because it's it it's less about like the emotion because if I'm gonna like do something where the piece is very much about like an emotion, it's very it's much easier for me to try to embody it in some photos because I sort of like know where I'm going with it, um, rather than to like direct somebody else or like project onto somebody else. So interesting. So the one on the right, ink. Oh, okay, there is some ink involved. How are you using ink with these? Is that C that one on the left looks like sepia ink? What kind of ink are you using on the one on the right? It's so soft. The one on the right, it's the same ink. Uh, it's just a different, I think, honestly, it's like a different um, quality of scan. Is it brown ink then? No, they're both just Speedball Super Black. Wow. Um, but I think also like the one on the right was on toned paper too. So like with the one on the left, it's a lot more like black and white. But with the one on the right, because the paper itself isn't white, I think there's a little bit less of that contrast too. So like the black doesn't seem as black because it's like not, it, it's contrasted with the, um, like a, a darker paper. The scan is also just like a touch too light, but. Um, so we're coming up on an hour, do you, um... Do you have any, did you have another image you were waiting to show us? And can you field a couple of questions from the students? Yeah, uh, um, I can just let this play if you guys want to ask questions. This is just a scratch board, um, just so you can see how that process works. 
Oh, neat. But yeah, then, um, I can't yeah, guarantee uh, the students will have questions, but yeah. if you students do, don't be shy. Um, you know, uh, let's, if there's anything you want to ask Carolyn about her, um, Caroline, sorry, about uh, her career, her process, uh, her, um, the psychology of her pieces, anything, feel free to ask questions. Otherwise, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to share some of your work uh, with her and then we can take a break. Scratch board, huh? Yeah, I just kind of liked it. I bought some scratch boards once and just like on a whim. So, um, yeah. so you're engaging with TikTok now and how are you I, finding that as compared to say Instagram? I hate it. I feel yeah. so old. I bet I, I, I can believe it. I just like the process of having to create content on, on top of the pieces that I'm making. Um kind of sucks like I, I I like as like an end user I like seeing how people make stuff so I can kind of get the value of like being able to see how people make stuff because like I've I've learned a lot from other people by watching how they make stuff um I just don't really like having to think about shooting videos while I'm working on something yeah um I'm going to share my own screen and um here show you you i already sh sent carolyn a bunch of your work everybody and um so she has seen a lot of this stuff edna this is a new piece i haven't seen yet uh last week our assignment caroline was to talk uh use folds i gave them a bunch of fold theory uh tutorials and then the idea was to use the folds to heighten the drama of the scene so this is one I haven't seen, whoops, and this by Edna. And I like this a lot, especially the figure in the foreground. I also like how gestural the world around the figure is with these plants um, and these kind of willow vines coming down here. Um, the only note that I would have is everybody, a big note that I make when I teach is, um, I have kind of a 10 commandments of drawing. And one of them is, um, there's certain things I say again and again. So I started to compile them into a list. And number one on the list is try to use diagonals whenever you can. So this image, while I, I like this so much, I think it would be even better if this wasn't such a 90 degree angle and this couch is just a little bit more angled. It makes it feel less predictable. It makes it feel more alive, even that much. Now the couch is kind of angled towards the character. Because most of us start, our default kind of setting is all these 90 degree lines. This one I don't mind so much because at least it's kind of going up and down. So that makes it feel a little bit not as static. But this couch, I think, is so, it's, it's just the same, it's the same shape as the canvas itself. So it becomes a little bit deadening and repetitive. So just angling it, and then we got to figure out what kind of perspective you want to use. Do you want to show the side of the couch here? That's fine. Or you want to have it going towards a uh, angled, you know, where it's going away from us, that could work too. Um, Caroline, do you have any notes on this? One of the things I do really like about it is it has that, like you were talking about the gestural uh, nature of some of the vines. Um, and that's one thing that I think is actually really nice because it sort of tells you where you are supposed to focus your attention as well. Like, I think um, with some of the vines and stuff like that, your your brain kind of fills in like, okay, I know that that's a vine. Moving on to the thing where there's like really nice contrast and sort of like more finely rendered stuff. I know that this were, this is where I'm supposed to be paying attention. So I also do really like that there's like a very different visual rendering between between the front figure and the back um because it's sort of it it's almost like the back figure is like behind a pane of glass almost yeah, yeah. it like it creates sort of an atmospheric perspective also just yeah I like these thin lines quite a bit and I love these like kind of loopy lines on the inside of the couch it's real tight I mean you got you're capturing very subtle little like the way the foot slipping under the thigh the way that the um 
uh, the way the fabric is falling to reveal the vest, the way the folds in the vest are wrapping around the chest, all of that, and especially the gesture of the hand, all of that is really nice, especially, Edna, if, if you can tell me again, how old are you? Um, I'm 16. I think that's what I thought. So yeah, I, spe I mean, Carolyn, we, I Carolyn knew, when I showed her your work was, I couldn't do this type of work at their age. And I don't, I'm not sure if I could do a lot of this now. And I feel the same way. Yeah, like the 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 sort of shorthand in the fabric for that leg that's coming towards you. That's like it's really nicely, like smartly observed. Very well, very much so. Okay, cool. This is another one I haven't seen till now. Whoa, uh, Cowie, this is so intense. It's really like it's. Re I love this liquid quality to it. And I love how kind of dreamlike it is. It feels like there's like some demon imagery and also some kind of just pure fantasy realm imagery going on. Um, I like the intersection of angular shapes, like this beautiful sword contrasted with its opposite, this kind of syrupy liquid quality very nicely done um also i like how all the good contrast right i mean the blacks are placed perfectly uh in a space where you can read them clearly you have blacks against grays you have grays against whites and you're there everything is strategically um uh you know arranged so that nothing is too murky or confusing Cool, right? Cowie, this is very much, a, I mean, sorry, uh, Caroline, this is very much like an aesthetic after your own heart, I believe. Yeah, I was going to say, like, the the oil slicks coming out of, not oil slicks, but there, there's like a very viscous, oily quality to that black goo that, that I am very much into. There's also like a sort of intense dynamic energy because of the fact that it's all just a little bit askew. Yeah, that's true. It's a it's a good example of angles. It's definitely, I love that this character is not, they're off center. If their spine was right on the center line, it would be right here. And this character yeah. is also just a little bit off center. Their feet are on the center line, their head and the angle of their body is not. And I really think it's, I think that's really nice the way that it, it plays with that. There's also um, a nice kind of like division of um the space especially this weird these weird uh jagged shapes coming down that get smaller as they go back i like that they're in the upper third of the composition there's like a interesting balance between this gray area and this gray area this very large white area with this black bisecting it it's really nice it's like a reflective symmetry but it's not um there's like a mirror line, but it's not super regular. So it, it sort of gives you like an echo almost. And Cowie, how old are you? Are you 16 as well? No, 14. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, that is crazy. So uh, in cool. the best way. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Okay, Joy. Oh, sorry, I have to turn off this tool. Clear drawings. There we go. Wow, I like the facial expression already. And then I'm gently trying to move this over. It's a weird thing about mural. It's like the controls are a little bit weird sometimes. Okay, there, like there's the toolbar right there. I can barely grasp it. So let me try something else. I think I, I'm still like struggling with the, oh. the, the cape and stuff because like I'm trying to find like reference on this type of clothing. Like really? What do you mean when you say the cape? Yeah, the cape that this character it kind of looks like a a rain poncho. Um, 
I think it looks very finished to me. I mean, what else would you, what would you want to do that it's not doing? Mm. I think in in some ways it, it might not like look very like mm, how to say it kind of looks too like smooth that it's not really realistic. Um, I do think that's realistic. I think that when things move in space, there's like a randomness to it that might surprise you. But if you don't like this. You could double up the line right here. Oh. And then have another kind of, oh, I don't like that as much as I thought I would, but there's, you can, there we go. You could have like more lines continuing that you didn't in first intend. Um, this black could kind of make, make a different pen. I will say that the smoothness of it does kind of lend um, a good sense of motion. Because yeah. if you think about like when a piece of fabric moves through space, if it's like in the process of moving, it might not be super wrinkly. The wrinkles might happen when it sort of settles. I, I couldn't agree more. I don't mind this though. This feels, what I just added, I'm not sure how you feel about it, but I like this. And it is in the spirit of what you're doing. And I have felt you know, one of the things I showed in my demos. Uh, so the first thing I think I showed, I, I showed these students was doing capes and co loose coats and sheets. And um, I do recommend that people can explore the space inside of this until it kind of looks like bubble gum. And I tell them to do short lines and you can experiment making this billowing around. But what you're doing is more of a tight voluminous fold it actually makes a ton of sense to me because there's the sense of uh, what happens to a sail when the wind catches it. And when things are billowing around, they they go up and down. This looks to me like a, something where the wind is kind of captured here and it's built, pushing us down. And I don't know, maybe there's another current coming from below. Uh, well, so when I was, yeah. But, Sorry, when I was little, I had this um, Beauty and the Beast like making of VHS. And it had a lot of like looking at how they'd animated, like how the fabric moved as like the beauty character was like spinning and dancing and stuff like that. There might be some fun kind of examples in like, um, you know, cartoons where you see somebody like sort of spinning in a, a kind of a, a larger fabric dress kind of thing if you want to see but like I, I don't know I think I think the cape looks really lovely I do too but yeah if you want to keep on adding more wrinkles you could here I'm adding one more I think I'm still deciding if I should make it a dress or a cape because like I don't know which suits the action better like which, which type of clothing will show more of the action it feels like you've committed to the cape to me what would make it a dress like another sleeve coming down here now that's still kind of a a cape well yeah well, like a cinch i'm not what, what what else would make it more like a dress instead of a cape because mm, i kind of made like more sketches like one one on the top left i'm thinking of oh, maybe okay. make it a dress all right let's see here i think no top right I'm trying. <laughs> I'm yes, trying. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it doesn't come up over the sleeve as much. I think you've come this far, and I do think it's really working. Um, you could do another drawing if you wanted that. Uh, but I like this a lot. If you want to get it out of your system to see if you could draw that dress, that would be great. Uh, but okay. this is working so well to, to me. I love, love, love the folds in the wolf sleeve as well. And these that you're going to be bringing in, I think are going to get more and more polished. Um, all really good. And, you know, if it's not perfect, it's like Caroline was saying, Caroline was saying, like, it is, we're always going to, we're always going to want to go further. And sometimes you just have to find a, a point to stop. I would also add to that, that Consider every draw, every drawing, every drawing you're doing, a chain on a step uh, to your evolution. 
and it is going to the next time you tackle this you'll take whatever you learned on this and get a little bit better okay okay wow these are so cool interesting maggie um and so this is interesting because this is also a very 90 degree line the the figure is very straight and so is the mic don't mind it here it's one of those and this line as well it's a this one i would change i like the mic i like this character kind of almost violently being placed into this image like right in the middle like but this is maybe one 90 degree line too much so again everybody we all start off with a 90 degree line is the first thing we think of this curtain could be more uneven or it could be angled like this which i think is more exciting it's more interesting and more dynamic uh maybe not all the way down there maybe just kind of up and down a little bit more it's just too much of a straight line here. Caroline, what do you think? One of the things that's kind of fun about how like dead on the figure is, is that it really sort of like emphasizes the fact that that woman is very much like on display um, based on how she's kind of performing. So like you, she sort of is that sort of central figure. And then you have the other figure sort of angled to see her. I think is kind of nice. There's a there's an implied narrative. Yes. That I think is really but by, by the way, I loved what you said before about defining the male gaze. I gotta admit, I've um all I'm very familiar with the term. I've never heard a formal this I've never heard a formal definition of it. And I the what what you said was what would you say something about it's an extension of the way that society views women from a male perspective? Yeah, and I think anytime you have, and there have been some really cool art shows that are sort of organized around this theme that I've seen some folks participate in, but it's, uh, you know, there are a lot of artists who are, um, especially women artists working with the female form in a way where it sort of takes it back um, and kind of, you know, creates like a meta commentary in a way. Um, but yeah. You know what else I would love in this? I'm a big fan of this shape, like an S, a little S curve. Let me draw something. So I'm often telling the students, not just in all of my classes, like give somebody like a string that's coming off of them. I'll tell a student, why don't you have like a loose, a loose shoelace on the shoe? Because then you get a chance to draw this little noodly shape going through the image. I would love like to see, Bella. what's that? like a feather bow on the singer. I would that would be great. I was going to suggest maybe on the male character you could have um his tie askew right here. I mean, why not? He's so this doesn't really I mean, unless there's a wind, it doesn't really make sense, but that's a beautiful it's like a surreal kind of beautiful element and it also makes it feel like um there could be a reason for it in the narrative, but it also allows you a chance to have things twisting around that plays off of how static things are. So uh, that's what I would do, but a bow would be good too. Yeah, I like the way it cuts across, it can cut across the, the drape and maybe even all the way onto the stage, which ties all the elements together. And that's another one of my uh, rules on my list is use overlap. So there's great overlap. The way he's sitting against the curtain is great. She's isolated, which I think is very appropriate. I think it's one, another thing that's giving the image this interesting tension. Um, and uh, so, yeah, maybe just a little bit like this. This one also has a nice sense of all of the images interacting in a nice way. This path here, maybe twist it behind the hair a little bit. One more chance to overlap and make things even more entwined and integrated. One thing that's kind of fun about integrating stuff like that too is that your eye, when you look at a picture, it looks for things to sort of follow. So when you do kind of overlap and connect stuff like that, it, it sort of guides the eye around the picture plane. So it sort of tells you kind of where to move. 
yeah. it's sort of the same effect that like the curtain on the left side has right now is that it sort of keeps your eye in i guess if that makes sense um keep it say that say that in a different way what do you mean keep it in it sort of when you look at the the picture um on the left and i see that that curtain is there my eye is then instead of going off the picture plane my eye is then sort of guided down by the lines to the guy who's sitting yeah. there do you think it sort like, of keeps you from going out of the frame it's like they kind of they form almost like a dancing like figures dancing yeah. together and you kind of cascade down these lines and are directed towards the rest of the image and these as well is that what you're is that do you think that is true yeah it also yeah it's just really nice i love the way that it's fr literally framing these elements and there's a nice rule of thirds going on here this is a diagonal third and then there's kind of like an interesting negative spaces right here and then these two are right in the middle third diagonal this one has it too one third two thirds three thirds and then it's also you can make the argument that there's other thirds as well like it hurt uh this very up you know there's a vertical thirds and diagonal thirds and some images have horizontal thirds and people talk about there's something very pleasing about thirds um some things compositionally i feel like caroline might and i might have different ways of talking about the same things in terms of composition um there's a lot of things about directing the eye and um rule of thirds and things like that i've heard teachers talk about and i talk about them in my in my own way um and caroline uh talks about uh has her own way of looking at them and some of it i'm not caroline i'm not sure if the, you would concur with this a lot of it just comes through um intuition and some of it comes from things i've been taught in school yeah i mean like at the end of the day a lot like a lot of the composition stuff that i got taught um you kind of know it like when you look at something and you think like this is missing something frequently it's because there's something in the composition that's empty or like you might see how something is laid out and then maybe there's something in the drawing that points you off the, the canvas or the paper or something like that and like there's nothing that stops you from kind of move so like if the guy for instance was like looking off to the right and there was nothing there no then as a person i would be like what's he looking at and then i would look and it's it would take me off the paper but because you can kind of see where he's looking or if he's looking and there's like a curtain there then you would sort of wonder like what is he looking at instead of like your eye leaving the canvas so i think this is all like super effective as far as keeping the viewer kind of engaged but to josh's point it's it's stuff that I think you all kind of know instinctively. Um, so we have a, a bunch of different ways of describing it and, you know, all sorts of fancy language that you can apply to it. But at the end of the day, also, you kind of know it in your gut. Yeah. Yeah. And you can judge for yourself, like what makes sense to you, what doesn't. And hopefully you augment, you grow, get beyond. Everybody has the same tendency to start with 90 degree lines. It's the first thing we think of. So I try to ask people to make it a little bit more exciting and consider, do you want to shift something a little bit? Do you want to make it a little bit less static? And that's why I made the edge of the curtain there a little bit more bumpy and um, uh, unpredictable. Um, yeah, let's keep on going. Um, Caroline, I don't know what your schedule is like. Uh, if we have time to go to everybody's stuff, great. Otherwise, what do you want to, do you need to go? What's, what are things looking like for you? Um, I probably need to go around 10, um, but I'm good for the next like 20 minutes. Okay, cool. Like Everybody, minutes. so usually we take a break by now. Let's take a longer break later and just stick with, since we have the opportunity to have Caroline here, let's like try to take advantage of that. And um, yeah, we have, it's a class of seven students. So I think we've already done three. Oh my gosh, this is great. Michelle, whoa, this is moody. It's beautiful. I love the, we just talked about going with characters' eye lines, how the eye moves you through an image. I love the facelessness of this image. And I love the way 
you can see her face, you can see her eyelash even, this figure down here, but it's also very obscured. It feels like it's not quite finished because I wanna see how you resolve these lines. And I could see you doing something like Caroline did in some of her images uh, tonight where there's a lot of really thin lines coming down. Let me pick an even thinner tool. Well, um, what were you thinking of doing with this piece? Sorry, whose was this? James right here. I can see the lines kind of shooting down here in a really thin, delicate way. Yeah, like that. I think also just the amount of like really heavy, like positive negative space and the fact that it's very graphic and very flat. It's the type of thing where I don't know that you even need to do too much to the background because mm -hmm. the, the sort of the visual vocabulary that you're using is already so sort of punchy um, and like strong. Agreed. Yeah, yeah it, it reminds, it's, it's very dramatic. It really I like is. it. Yeah, like a beautiful, um, a beautiful like 1920s film or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so maybe just some lines like this. I, if it was my image, I'd probably end up putting some gray here as well, but that's just me. I'm not sure if it needs it. Ugh, massacring this, but yeah. Sometimes that could be nice. I like the white space as well, though. Michelle, what do you think? What I see that you didn't quite finish these lines. What do you think about articulating them with really thin, thin shapes coming down? Um, yeah, I think I would try it. And Michelle, I can ask, how old are you? I'm 16. 16. Yeah, beautiful. Um, are these like what are these shapes down here? They look like nails. This is like um, a um, something like flowing around her. Oh, well, I see the fabric, but I mean these shapes right here, um, like right there and right there. Are those like nails like you see in a lot of religious art? Like, um, or pins? Is it like a dress of pins in it? Um, I don't know how to explain it. Um, um, it's like like the flowing decoration. Okay. Um, you can say it in Chinese and, uh, you know, Sophie or um, Aria can um, uh, can translate for you, too. Michelle,我猜这是想问的是那个钉子围绕在这个圣母玛丽像吗,还是周围吗,还是是什么东西呢? 光环一样的漂浮在他旁边装饰。Josh,he uh, yeah. means like the halo flow, flow, flow around the figure. The okay. ha glory halo flow, flow oh, around. Like a halo. Oh, uh, yeah, halo. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it has a really nice harmony and whatever these represent, they all feel like surrealist elements. They feel like spikes to me, which I think is interesting. And on a, just a purely compositional level, they, con they contrast and complement the flowing lines. The flowing lines are interrupted by these little spikes. That's what it feels like to me. And it's, I don't really need to know why they're there and exactly what whether this is a religious icon or what exactly is going on i get i get like um a lot i get a lot of the emotion and the soul of the piece without really knowing the specifics there's something about sort of the simple like shape too where um you can kind of put your own image onto it in a way that's really engaging 
So like Josh has his interpretation that it might be sort of like nails or sort of religious related. We we're talking about pins. I think there's something nice in not knowing that makes you want to look at it more. Yeah. Because it's it's like a really nice sort of um shorthand for something that could be a lot of things. Um and that's that's something where like your your eye kind of finds that really interesting and then tries to sort of figure out well what is it and then sort of keeps looking and there's a whole range of possibilities that's really fun. She's also just statuesque. It's very fun. I just can't stop staring at this figure. I just love that face. It's so well done. It looks like a uh, it looks like a lot of people, a lot a lot of other artists I love. Reminds me a little bit of a Jaime Hernandez image. Yeah, I can see yeah. that. Just one of the, the great masters of ink. Okay, let's see if I can yeah. zoom out a little bit. Let's also see what happens if I. Refresh this. Oh, there we go. Okay, good. So the most of the rest of the work I think is from last week. Uh, oh, okay. One more from Ollie that uh, I have not seen. This is insane. Wow. Okay, I can tell already this is really impressive. Whoa. I know. Wow. Just such a work ethic from these students. It's amazing. The The like shape of the brush kind of it reminds me of a lot of really like amazing comic work it's for sure for sure it's stunning um again it's another very ambiguous space i'm going for my interpretation is that it's like a, somebody in bed and there's like a dream kind of a dream crowd uh a formation of a kind of amorphous cloud-like shapes. Oh, I see, it's like melting clocks. Yeah, I like this a lot. This looks like a sheet and the figures re like the, fi the whole direction of the figure's hair and everything is pointing down to this other hemisphere. Really interesting. And I love this split. Is this um, part of a longer story or is this a standalone piece, Ollie? Oh, they Sorry, here? Josh. Ali had uh, already tag on leave. Okay, okay, no problem. Um, well, then, uh, let's see if there's any new, new, maybe more new stuff, and maybe we can wrap it up. Um, I showed you this piece last week. This was by, was this Ozpin? This reminds oh, Hi, it's Joy. Oh, hey, Joy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do, have you done any more work on this? I'm still working on the background and stuff. And um, yeah, really wonderful image. Those are my little blue notes there. Again, this is another one, everybody, that you can, uh, Caroline, you can see underneath. The dark kind of silhouetting arches behind them I thought would be better if they were a little bit more of an exciting angle. So I suggested doing it angled to the left like this, or kind of like a sort of a, um, yeah, a, a receding image or here where we're looking up a little bit, just anything but straight 90 degree angle. So just to show how often I repeat the same, that same lesson, that's, uh, it, it, it's, um, necessary. It's always something I have to tell beginning students. So, you know, as advanced as these students are, that's one of the few places that I can consistently give them support. Yeah, that's one too, where I think if you put, if you change the perspective a little bit on those arches, it puts you down sort of in the same position as the smaller figure. Mm. So it helps you sort of feel like you're kind of next to that person, or you're sort of seeing this from their point of view. 
Um, let's see. Ozpin, did we look at anything by you? Let's look at Ozpin because I, I she's wonderful as well. And I would be sure that you get we get Caroline's POV on her work. Edna Joy Shoot. That's Michelle, who you looked at before. More by Edna. Yeah, I mean, just to reiterate, like, it's wild to me that you guys are able to accomplish this stuff at this age. I couldn't draw anywhere near it's this really, well. It's very inspiring. And they're like, they're obsessed. Like, they have like this fire in them for doing artwork that I often have to force people their age to try to cultivate. And they have it, they already are very, like, there's so much desire to be artists that's visible in this work. Uh, so it's really been a, it's it's a highlight of my week. Every week I get to see this work. Osmond, where's your stuff? I'm so sorry, I'm having trouble finding it. It's Cowie's. Then, um, we let's give everybody a chance to first of all let's thank you uh, Caroline so much for coming tonight to give everybody a chance to let's take like 20 minutes uh come back at 10 10 uh Caroline uh this is great this is exactly what I wanted out of you coming um and uh really really interesting to observe you talk about your work and the way you think about it and what your intent is and um uh like well I'm, I'll send a follow, I'll send you a follow-up email later on yeah, for sure. And thank you guys so much for taking the time to listen. And I loved getting to see your work. It's absolutely wild. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. Um, then uh, everybody, let's go on a 20 minute break. It's 950. I'll see you back here at 1010. And uh, Caroline, have a good night. Yeah, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Bye. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Thank you all.
Okay, uh, we are back. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, so uh, picking up where we left off about the next assignment, you're going to have three weeks to work on this so that if you're not done with the uh, previous assignment, that's okay. You can <laughs> wrap up that while beginning the new one. So it's, go it's fu really funny that Caroline brought up um, those one second. Um, those shapes because they're a lot like what we were just looking at. This image here uh, shows the type of plant that um, Akaneth, Akan, Acanthus. This is exactly like what we're just looking at in the other PDF. So you can see this is very traditional. I thought these were laurel leaves. I guess they're Akaneth leaves. Of all the ornamental designs which have been borrowed from plants, this one is the most powerful and conventional since its introduction into Greek style. So I'll put this into, this is already in chat and you can see different examples of it here, but this isn't the only shape that you need to, that you could do. Um, I'm not, I'm interested in people doing a frame that's anything that they want it to be. So if I'm doing a, Sorry, I'm trying to, there we go. If I'm doing an image of a cowboy, getting shot in the head or about to be. So here's somebody. Actually, let's make it not violent. It's just like somebody pointing at him and he's running away, whatever the image is. I might say to myself, what are all the things that make me, that I think of when I think about a cowboy? So there might be a sunset. There might be a horse. There might be him riding the horse. And then I can think of different ways to entwine these images. It might be with uh, with the leaves, and it might be another shape. It also might be might be snakes. It might be. A lot of times, uh, artists just use really expressive shapes like lightning. So this starts to become cool. I mean, it's inter I'm not that interested in telling a story about a cowboy. Uh, but this starts to get me more interested in it. So I have my image in the middle and then I have all the things that are surrounding it. And this is a tradition that's found in books. It's found in magazines. So, uh, a lot of times you have connective tissue. They do the same thing when they do tat, when you get tattoos, they have a few little cloudy shapes that kind of tie forms together. So these cloud shapes here just create like a, uh, some elements that make these flow around. So I might have a, a free flowing composition like this. And maybe in the middle, who knows what, you know, maybe it's about, uh, maybe a cowboy's life is barbaric. So I wanna have a barbarian here with like a horned helmet. I like to admit, like Caroline was saying, it's okay to be a magpie and to collect different ornamentation. So um, let's see, clear my drawings. Let's go back to the other PDF. So we were looking at this and it is showing different covers. So you can see that these are very angular. Um, there, this one, there are like a lot of figures and frames. This one is more geometric and angular. This one has intestines. This one's kind of easy in comparison. There's like intestines that are going all the way around the frame. 
this is Humbug, another magazine by the same artist who designed the first frame. And this one has vines. So again, this isn't nearly as elaborate, but it's also really nice. It really wraps around the form and frames it. This one has a bunch of people. These two are very similar in a way. In fact, this one, Humbug, the way the lettering is done looks a lot like the way Verdot is written with like where this is written it's just constructed out of like what looks like yarn or hay. There it is right up there. And that looks like the vines are dying. You can also really see how beautifully they do these scrolls. So these are really small. Um, I've drawn these a bit. And what you see is that not all of the lines are connected. See that? The line kind of fades out a little bit. You have so little room to move around when you're doing these frames that every little bit of space helps. So you're seeing these, it's a little bit like our fabric lesson. You're seeing these shapes wrap around and they're really constructed by the shadows as much as they are by the lines. So if the, full, if the, if the little banner is wrapping around like that, I'm getting a really good sense of dimension by doing these lines. So this is going up and I'm copying what I'm seeing here. So this goes up and around and it twists in. And one of the keys for doing a banner is that you wanna keep this little lip in mind there. See that space there? you have a sense of this form it's not just a paper thin shape it's got a little bit of width so there's a line like that going all the way around the top there's a little bit of space there and this banner ends up feeling like it has just a little bit of thickness So if I want to write um, nature on this, it really feels like it's on something which is three-dimensional, even though it's skinny. So maybe in my image, I have nature, and then I have a little frame, and then I have a sunset inside of it. Now, What's amazing is you look at this one up here, this eagle, just by adding cross hatching against these lines, you get a lot of dimension. So if I do this, I have a little bit of cross hatching like this inside of this little tiny banner, inside of this little tiny uh, frame, there's the ground, there's the sun, and then behind it, I have these lines. They feel very different. This one has it too. There's cross hatching and there's single lines. There's Caroline's stuff already was in the PDF. And um, if you go back a little bit, we have this image by Daniel Klaus. Now he told a whole story in this frame. This is called an acorn's journey. So in the first frame, we have an acorn. And then it turns into trees and the trees are cut down. And then the trees are taken to a paper mill and the paper, the paper mill turns the trees into paper. Then an artist buys the paper and they sit at their drawing board and they start drawing. And then they keep on drawing and grow older. They lose their hair. And then their son sees them drawing and then they seem to become like an, a neglectful parent and down at the bottom here you see one second you see that the son grows up and he looks kind of unhappy so the dad just keeps on staying obsessed with doing comics and the son gets a little bit older and then eventually the father 
works himself to death. So he drops, he drops dead right in front of his easel. And then his son takes all of his artwork and throws it in the garbage. But somebody comes and they retrieve it from the garbage. And then they exhibit it at an art show. And then that fails too. You can see this man here. He just doesn't look impressed. So this man throws in the garbage and then the earth is invaded by Martians and the Martians come and blow up the earth and then everything is destroyed. And you see the comic just decaying into the ground. And then the process starts again where we have new growth coming up. So the cycle starts again. So that's a very, very ambitious comic that, story that he tells. You don't have to tell a story. It can be um, just images like this. It can be, doesn't have to be a square either, but I want you to do an image where you are playing with your own kind of frame. So one second while I join from my other window, bear with me. Be right back. Okay, so whoops, try that again. So here's an image that I started to draw last night. same cowboy image. I did all this imagery going around the side. Here's another one that I'm pretty happy with where I did this figure and I started to do all this elaborate imagery around them. I don't want to mess with this one too much because I like where it's going. So let's play with this one. So here's another one. So it's a sketchbook image. And if I wanted to go further with it, I would just keep on going in, shading. Now, right here, I might do cross hatching because we were just talking about that and that image of that eagle. And when I go like that and I do cross hatching, this image becomes a little bit more dimensional, a little bit more readable. Oh, and this is a good chance to talk about using nibs. So, um, we talked about using nibs last week. Here's one of my nibs. Hopefully this one is working. And if I want to use this in this comic, this is a great tool for it because a lot of these methods are so traditional um, that there's a long history of people designing these shapes using old tools like this. 
So there I am, and I am going in and I'm doing some of those weak shapes that we we're just looking at. Now, I'm gonna do lines behind this, and it's really easy to get nice thin lines with the nib. Again, right here, inside of this frame, if I do cross hatching, look how, how well it pops out. By the way, you can see there's a little, I kind of spilled some ink there, no big deal. I'll get rid of it with white out later. Or I could somehow make this more shadowy and kind of disguise the mistake. Then this line. And one of the things I noticed in the PDF that there were a lot of these same directional lines going through these images like that. Same direction, same direction, same direction, same direction. Oh, I like this. It really is paying off. I was doing it like last night. And now I've had a day off and going back into it, it just really helps me layer in these effects. And I like what I'm doing more and more. I'm gonna go in and finish any of my lines, which I left open. Uh, Caroline mentioned that they did imagery which, where they used markers and nibs. And I'm the same way. I might use four different pens on one image. This was done with like a marker and I like it. There's advantages with every tool, but sometimes I have more patience when I'm using a nib. If I wanna do tiny little flex here on the side of the arm, popping it out and making it feel even more dimensional. This is a perfect tool to do it with. So you can get very deliberate lines, very careful lines. And you can get very scratchy lines like this. Sometimes when I'm doing shadows, I pretend that it's almost like an animal has clawed the shape. Like that. And I do these double, these kind of very deliberate scratchy lines. Now, this is all imagery that's from a graphic novel that I'm working on. So all the people that you're seeing appear in the graphic novel and that made my job easy. But as for you, I mean, who knows, whatever you're drawing, it might be, say you're drawing a self-portrait. Might draw yourself or somebody's stands for you. Maybe they're reading a book or they're drawing in their sketchbook. And then you would say, what are the things that define you or what are the things that define this character? So like I said in the description, the illustration in the middle could be anything you want. It could be a sensitive image. It could be a funny image. It could be whatever. And then you're gonna introduce this framework. So it might be the leaves that we were looking at. There's a twisting leaf going around like this. And then here could be anything. Maybe there's a frog, maybe there's a bird. Maybe the frog is very decorative, but it stands in for this person's relationship with nature.
So we looked at some imagery where we had we had lines on the outside. It's also okay to put lines on the inside to have this surrounded by white space. It's okay to have a frame. It's okay to have a very loose kind of shape like this. Where is it? Maybe down here, there's water and there's fishes here. So use your imagination, play with it. You can have angular shapes. You can have um, more flowing organic shapes. You also might want to have the character playing with the frame in an interesting way. Maybe they are um, stepping out of the frame. or they're chained to the frame. Here's a character. Who is chained to their frame like this. feels like kind of inevitable if all these entwining chain shapes, the chains would be one of them. So maybe there is a hand holding this chain and it symbolizes the forces that keep this person feeling confined. In fact, maybe I will play around with the scroll shape that I was talking about before and write the word internal conflict. Hey. Whoop. That's weird. I don't know why I just lost the screen. Maybe I didn't. Let me try that again. It looks like you're still seeing my screen, right? Now I'm using a thicker nib and I'm getting a thicker line. And that's interesting too. So this is one that looks as a fatter tip. It doesn't come to quite as much of a needle point tip. It really just depends on how you want to experiment and explore. But there's some advantages with a more graphic line, and there's some advantages with a thin, more delicate line. <laughs> and there's some disadvantages as well. Maybe I'm not getting quite as delicate as a line here, but the advantage is that maybe I'm not getting too fussy. So that was another thing that Caroline talked about is having a tendency to get really, really into the nooks and crannies of an image. Maybe there's some advantages in not and having a fatter line because you try to see how delicate you can make it while not being able to go too far. Let's see.
internal conflict. I see, okay, I see what happened. I'll go in and turn this into a chain. And let's continue some kind of pattern over here. So there's a lot of shapes that we can do. We can do binds like this or twisting. And maybe I do a little flex like this. And they can braid around each other. And uh, what other what other things fit into this image? Maybe I'll have some kind of robot here. Give them a little bit of an underbite. Draw a little bit closer. So I'm going to label him as well. Maybe his label is Mech and I, they, Shun. And then that makes me think of dehumanization. And I'll put that on the other side. Again, you see me doing that scroll that I was drawing before. Maybe I'll have these lines taper off in the dots. Okay, so this goes up and over. And I want people to be able to tell that it's a robot. So I'm going to put more of these little rivets around his head. And then this goes behind his head. So it should come out the other side. So maybe on the other side, another robot, like a twin robot. And this one is going to be labeled
Now, this is just a demo. I'm having a lot of fun with it. And you can see I didn't do pencils. That's just to save time. And also because, you know, it's just a demo. It's not an important assignment. So that's a low risk proposition. So I do like what I'm discovering that I can do by doing this demo. Um, there's certain things I might not have done if I did have more time to plan this. But there's other things that maybe aren't as good as they would be. Uh, I really want there to be a hinge right here so you can tell that it's a robot. And I'm not sure, I might need to plan that more to really get that to look the way that I want it to. Okay, so see what else we can do. Let's try some more of those leaves. So we have these leaves, they wrap up and over, and it's really just to create a little bit of flow that's going to tie this whole framework together. So I got to make a decision too. Do I want to do these lines right behind this guy? That certainly helps a lot. And it was something that I saw a lot with the work that I was looking at earlier tonight. So I want to put it on the outside of the laurel leaf, kind of going behind it and coming out the other side. Feels like that's a pretty good system because it pops out everything that is in front of it. And then if I don't go too far, um, maybe it can just pop out, it, it, pop it out on this side as well. Over here, it can go all the way behind this figure and then come out the other side. Pretty nice, it's starting to come to life. Um, yeah, and something I've been doing lately is I'll just go to the bottom of things and do very light shadow. So wherever there's a an edge, uh, if this person has a turtleneck on, then I'll go to the bottom of it and I'll just do very light lines. Like that. It's kind of amazing how quickly and effectively this can make things feel really three-dimensional. So the bottom of their sweatshirt, I'll have these lines like that, and they come up and around. The fact that they're thinner than the outer line really helps. It makes them look very delicate.
So I don't really know what this is about yet, but I'm going to keep it up and I'll wrap, I'll end up wrapping up these, this thing all the way around the figure. As you can see, it's almost like this hand is coming out of the ornate frame. So I think everybody gets it. Now, the other part of this lesson is that I want you to uh, color this with um, a limited palette. So what I'm gonna do is take this and appropriate. And let's say that's something I wanted to color. Now, of course I would scan this properly if I was really going to be using this, but I'm gonna use uh, I started doing a version of this last night and it look, ended up looking like this. And you can see that I'm using two colors. I'm using orange and blue because they're complements. So when we talk about color theory, this is a pretty good um, example of a color chart. We've got red, we've got purple, We've got blue, we've got green, we have yellow, and we have orange. And orange is across from blue. Uh, red is across from green. And yellow is across from purple. Those are the comp the colors that look complementary with the with their opposite. And the reason that the color wheel is formed the way it is is because if you take red and you take yellow and you push them towards each other, you're just naturally going to get orange. If you take red and you push it towards this blue, where they mix up together, you're gonna to get violet, purple. And the purple's across from the yellow. So that's how you end up finding out which colors are, um, are complementary. Red, the complement to red is green. And how do we get green? We take blue and we push it towards the yellow. We take the yellow and push it towards the blue and where they get mixed up, you're gonna get green. So that's how you figure out your complement. So with this one, I started to color it with orange and um, blue. Um, you can explore like a full range of different oranges and blues. So let's say with this image, I wanted to explore green, green and red, maybe um, yellow and purple. Let's try yellow. So there's a lot of different ways to use yellow. You can use on these pieces of paper that are kind of fluttering around in the image. You can use it in the backdrops around these images. But you don't have to just use one type of yellow. You can use multiple yellows. bright yellow,
maybe more of a slightly orangey yellow. It's a little bit too orange. There we go. Better. So you can push it. I mean, there's a little touch, even though I'm using yellow, there's touches of green, there's touches of orange in it, but it's still mostly in the yellow spectrum. Make this guy's pants yellow. So now when I, when I'm, after I'm done exploring this for a while, then I introduce the op opposite, which is across from it on the color wheel, purple. And that's kind of a warm purple. So I don't think it's quite as good as a slightly more blue purple would be. Though I'm also a big believer in if purple looks good, honestly, you can use the color next to the purple as well. Blue looks really good as well. So I'm contrasting cool with cool with warm. And I'm contrasting um, blue and bluish purple with yellow. And those two things are going to look really nice together. So I'm going to keep on thinking, how many different types of blue could I use? Maybe the sweatshirt is a brighter, darker blue. I got to be careful. This is pretty dark. And it might be too dark to, you know, that it might obscure some of these lines. But so far, I think it's OK. It's about as dark as I want to get because it's so dark that you can just barely see the lines under it. You don't want to get something that's really, really dark. And maybe I'll tint it just a, a little bit more violet. In fact, I could do this. Quick. Okay. You could do this and start to do more of an opaque purple on top of this. And that can look like light. Sometimes I like to have two different light sources, one coming from one side and one coming from the other. So maybe I have a little bit of this yellow, this a little bit of this yellow light hitting him from the other side. And all that it combines to make him feel really dimensional. So complementary colors, right? I have purple, honestly, I have purple and blue, but you know felt like it was necessary for this piece. It could also just make this all purple. Um, and it gives the imagery a lot of harmony. These little ghost figures up here, maybe I'll make them purple as well. So like Caroline was saying, there's something about limiting your color palette that can focus your work and not overwhelm you, but your mileage may vary. So let's look at some... Oh, uh, we're getting really close to the end, aren't we? We're actually over time. So we can go into this next week. Let me show you this very quickly and then I'm gonna let you all go. Um, thank you everybody so much for your time this week. Uh, uh, Josh? Yeah. I want to make sure uh, students only need to uh, give the pencil sketch homework next week and they just need to finish it in three weeks, right? That's right, absolutely. So everybody- okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Let me just show you this one last thing and then we'll call it a night. Thank you. Um, so this is a book, uh, a series of book um, images that I collected. 
book illustration. And I think this is, if this isn't in, in the module, I'll put it in there. Whoa. Okay. I see, okay. New share. There we go. So um, right here, look at the how limited these colors are. This, especially back here in the distance of this image, this the blue is very, uh, I'm sorry, the sky has just a little touch of blue in it. This guy has an orange shirt. Over here, it's just one color, blue. And then on these very old covers here, just green. And here, old Wizard of Oz image, just yellow and blue over here on the right. Maybe a little bit of green right here on the uh, scarecrow. It's strange choices, and I think some of these were done because um, it was cheaper. This one also is mostly red and blue, or green, maybe a greenish blue. This one is just green and white. This one is red and green on the right. So I'm going to let you go, but I'll see you next week, hopefully. But um, that's the... Uh, that is uh, what I want you to think about for the colors. So next week, uh, think, think about the colors long-term. Next week, have this uh, partially done, more done the, th the second week, and then you'll have a third week. So that's it. Thank you all so much. Um, really enjoyed seeing you tonight, as always, and I hope to see you next week. Have a good weekend. Have a great weekend. So.